In this class, we will deal with the non-governmental human rights movement, which has been the main driving force for the observance and respect for human rights. We have stated in the first class of this course that for several decades now, human rights has become a common day-to-day -day expression and it has acquired great moral legitimacy worldwide. Indeed, at present, it is a topic that is found in newspaper headlines in acronym form and every reader knows what it means. It is also an integral part of the agenda of the United Nations and an obligatory reference in political speeches everywhere. The credit for these developments belongs to the human rights movement. By human rights movement we refer to non-governmental organizations as well as to ordinary people working worldwide for the promotion and respect of human rights. The non-governmental human rights movement started in the 1960s. In the immediate years after World War II, governments acting through the newly created United Nations had taken a number of initiatives to enshrine in international law, human rights, as well as other humanitarian concerns. They also took important steps towards establishing forms of international criminal justice for particularly heinous crimes. Yet, this initial momentum came to a halt with the onset of the Cold War and nothing of much importance for human rights happened in the 1950s other than the anti-colonial process. The 1960s, a turning point time in many senses, witnessed the emergence of uh, the non-governmental human rights movement, which took up the banners that governments had all but abandoned. Amnesty International was founded in 1961. Later on, other international human rights organizations were created. At the national level, in the 1970s, human rights organizations sprouted in places under dictatorial rule, first in South America, then in Eastern Europe. Soon, most countries counted local human rights organizations. As the human rights movement expanded, the issue gained uncontested legitimacy. Sure enough, at that point, many tried to appropriate the idea of human rights to buttress their own political agenda. As a consequence, observers began to distinguish between credible and not so credible human rights organizations. The most credible ones are characterized by the fact that they are not for profit. They work for the rights of all and treat similar situations similarly. They do not subordinate their concern for human rights to other agendas and their work is conducted rigorously and professionally. They are the flagships of the human rights flotilla, the core of the human rights movement. Over time, the work of these serious human rights organizations has mobilized the United Nations and other intergovernmental organizations into creating or activating international treaties and mechanisms for human rights protection and promotion. Their work and jurisprudence has begun increasingly to capture headlines. Yet, there are two actions that should never be forgotten. A, whether deemed as natural faculties or historical breakthroughs, human rights are not graciously granted by the powers that be. Rather, they are conquered by the persistent demand of organized common people be, as a corollary, the strengths and successes of the human rights cause rest in the end on the actions of the human rights movement. It is this non-governmental movement, the impulse behind whatever human rights policies or initiatives may be adopted by individual governments or by intergovernmental organizations such as the United Nations. International human rights organizations began to be formed first, beginning in the 1960s. Then, national organizations were created in many places, Brazil, 
Chile, El Salvador, the Philippines, Southern Africa. They worked under the umbrella of the Catholic Church or of a coalition of churches. As the human rights movement grew, regional organizations were founded, either to provide support to the national ones within their region or to work directly for human rights in that area. Some organizations, such as Amnesty International, are membership-based. This organization declares to have more than 3 million supporters, as well as members and activists in 150 countries. Other organizations are basically staff-driven, even if they may have a committed board of directors. An example is Human Rights Watch. Yet others are governed by a body of members of a certain profession. Lawyers, in the case of the International Commission of Jurists. Physicians, in the case of Doctors Without Borders. A few international organizations, including all three just mentioned, work for human rights all over the world. National organizations concern themselves mainly with human rights in their respective countries. Regional organizations do so regarding one or more countries within their region. Many international organizations focus on the protection and promotion of human rights in one or more countries, regions or sub-regions. Major international human rights organizations tend to work more on civil and political rights, although some, including Amnesty International, have branched out to economic, social and cultural rights as well. Other organizations focus on specific rights or situations, such as freedom of expression, women's rights, the rights of indigenous peoples, the rights of migrants, etc. Also, First Human Rights Watch and then Amnesty International, among others, have long ago included as part of their work the monitoring of internal and international wars to ascertain if the international norms of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, are respected. Documenting individual human rights abuses or patterns of human rights violations and disseminating these reports is a method almost universally used by non-governmental human rights organizations. Some, like Human Rights Watch, take special care to target this information to the US authorities. Other common methods of work include campaigning for an issue or a country urgent action networks to be mobilized in case of an imminent abuse or to stop an ongoing violation, sending observers to trials when it is to be feared that fair trial guarantees may not be respected, promoting congressional or intergovernmental hearings or the approval of specific treaties, assisting the victims of human rights violations and their relatives in their needs including medical treatment, and seeking to bring to justice the perpetrators of human rights violations. Most human rights organizations have adopted policies on funding, tending to secure the reality and the image of their impartiality. They include not accepting donations from governments or from compromising sources. Neither do they accept money with strings attached to them or donations that represent a significant enough percentage of their budget so that they may create a relationship of dependence. Please visit our website mookchile.com and watch the next class of this course.